Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for real-time personalized customer experiences at Bonobos. My name is James Jory. I'm a partner solutions architect with AWS. And I'm pleased to be joined today um, by, by uh, Anikat Diastali from Bonobos, who's the uh, head of analytics and data science, and um, uh, Calvin French Owen, who's the CTO of Segment. So this is a um, introductory level session. So we're not going to be getting uh, too in depth um, in the technology or looking at source code or anything like that. But we will be looking at some architectures and uh, most importantly, um, learning about some of the real world, real, real world learnings of, of Bonobos. So a quick look at the agenda. Uh, we'll start by looking at some of the foundational uh, requirements and capabilities of building uh, what I'm calling a retail data platform. And these are some of the important things to keep in mind when you're looking to build personalized experiences on top of AWS. Then we'll look at some of the building blocks provided by AWS for um, actually building your own personalized solutions. And Calvin will give us an introduction to Segment's customer data infrastructure. And Anaket will give us an overview of the personalization platform built at Bonobos. The bulk of the session will actually be an interactive Q&A between Calvin and Aniket, um, where we'll learn about some of the business and um, technical aspects of the journey of uh, Bonobos building their uh, personalization infrastructure. So with that, let's get started. So um, before looking to build personalized experiences um, into your applications, uh, particularly if you're coming from just having a, a purpose-built application that's using a purpose-built database, um, delivering a customer experience. When you start looking at building personalized experience, there's a number of additional disciplines that you need to keep in mind. Um, there's aspects such as uh, um, machine, machine learning, um, ETL processes where you're transforming data into different formats. And so um, we'll talk a bit about uh, some of the, the criteria that's important to keep in mind when you're building out this infrastructure. We'll use the metaphor of a uh, pipeline that covers the four main stages of ingestion, storage, analysis, and then uh, consuming insights. So customer and operational data enters this pipeline through various ingestion endpoints. And uh, we'll consume uh, insights and visualizations at the consumption layer. So at the ingestion layer, um, we need services that can support the ingestion of data in different velocities and formats, um, real-time streaming data, um, integrations through uh, either applications we may have on-premise or with third parties, um, as well as supporting bulk data uploads of log files or video files, images, audio files, things like that. Some of the services that uh, we'll use at the ingestion tier uh, include uh, Amazon Kinesis or Apache Kafka for streaming data, um, also for uh, any retail IoT experiences, Amazon's IoT Core allows integration with these um, IoT devices. And then uh, for integrations, there's Amazon API Gateway, which allows you to integrate with your own applications, whether they be um, on-premise or third-party. And for bulk data um, uh, ingestion, Amazon provides services such as import-export, um, storage gateway, or some of the new services we announced this week, which is a managed SFTP service on top of S3, or the new data sync service that was announced this week as well. When it comes to um, storing data, we want a storage layer that gives us fine grain and flexible security capabilities so that we can control access uh, to our data at the user, application, and tool level. Uh, we also want our storage tier to be durable and scalable. So we want data to be stored uh, in multiple, multiple copies of our data across multiple availability zones, as well as being able to scale up as the volume of data grows over time and being able to uh, support uh, spikes in volume in, in ingestion. Um, we want our data in our uh, storage tier to also be discoverable so that um, as, as data scientists and data analysts start working with our data, they can um, explore data catalogs to find out where different data lives and, and what its format is. And of course, we want it to be cost-effective and future-proof so that the data we're collecting today can be used for building applications that we haven't even envisioned yet. Some of the um, uh, services that, that are used here, so for structured or transactional data, of course, there's Amazon RDS, 
For semi-structured data, there's uh, Amazon DynamoDB or MongoDB. Um, for uh, um, uh, file-based or object-based storage, there's um, S3, of course, um, as well as Amazon EFS. When it comes to analyzing the data, we want tools that are scalable and flexible and also support uh, an iterative development process. So you see the bi-directional ar arrows between um, storage and analysis. And so we want tools to be able to consume data from the storage tier, uh, perform some transfer transformation or reorganization of the data, and then be able to store it back to our storage tier. We also want to encourage experimentation in the analysis phase. Um, so being able to allow uh, data analysts to be able to um, quickly be able to explore data, maybe try some experimentation, or our developers um, work on some new ideas or concepts, and then be able to decommission any resources they used uh, during the experimentation with, with no risk. Uh, some of the, the tools and technologies that you, you, would, you would use here, of course, is Amazon EMR, which is AWS's Hadoop as a service. That gives you access to uh, the entire um, Hadoop ecosystem, uh, including Spark, Flink, um, Pig, uh, you know, and, and many other uh, libraries uh, um, that are used with Hadoop. There's also Amazon Redshift, which is AWS's uh, petabyte scale data warehouse that allows you to analyze your data. And um, Amazon StageMaker, which um, allows you to build and train your machine learning models uh, based on data that you have in your storage layer. When it comes to consuming data, we not only want to be able to visualize uh, and explore our data, but we also want to have scalable endpoints that we can um, stand up so that our applications can uh, consume these insights, these machine learning inference endpoints that we'll look at later in the talk. So I've discussed a number of AWS services across each of these um, four parts of the pipeline. Uh, there's also thousands of partner-provided solutions, uh, one of which um, we're looking at today is segments that uh, partners that who build, build further up the application stack and do more of the heavy lifting so that you're able to focus on what differentiates your product with your customers. So let's take a, uh, a turn and take a quick look at some of the building blocks that are available for building personalized experiences on AWS. A quick level set on the definition of what personalized experiences are is there are truly unique digital experiences that are specific to each customer. And some examples include uh, recommendation systems or related products. Uh, these can be uh, products, people, um, services, or content. There's also personalized search results where results are reorganized based on the preferences of each user. And we can also create special offers that are tailored to each particular user as well as um, uh, tailored digital marketing campaigns. So we'll look at a, a particular class of personalized solutions, and these are um, recommender systems. There's three different um, approaches to building recommender systems. First is knowledge-based filtering, which is uh, making recommendations based on uh, similarity of items. So this is uh, the classic example of uh, related products. And what we need to build these systems is we have to have detailed information about the items that we're recommending. So for products in e-commerce, it might be um, product description, um, categories, uh, style, uh, tags, different things like that that allow us to um, calculate similarity between items. Next is content-based filtering, which builds on knowledge-based filtering by adding an element of user preference. So uh, an example here is if you like this product, you may like these other products. Besides the item attributes and metadata that we need to have uh, from the knowledge-based approach, we're also incorporating some user feedback into our recommender system. And finally, collaborative filtering takes a different approach, where it's making recommendations based on the behavior of users that have provided similar feedback uh, as the user for which we're creating recommendations. The canonical example here is Amazon.com's uh, customers who bought product X would or have also bought product Y. And what's unique about collaborative filtering solutions is that they're, they're, they really do not depend on any knowledge of the items for which they're making recommendations. Instead, they're dependent completely on, on um, extensive user behavior. And uh, this makes this particular approach susceptible to what's called a cold start problem, uh, where you need a, a significant amount of data based on user preferences uh, before you can start making recommendations. So in practice, what um, 
uh, most customers do is actually a combination of, of all three of these or a few of these different approaches to create an overall personalized experience. So let's take a um, cl closer look at some of the different types of feedback um, that, that are fed into uh, collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. Explicit feedback uh, is, requires the users, users to explicitly rate items. Um, so on Netflix, it's rating movies or rating products. Uh, it's liking or disliking products. It's also asking users to rank items um, or create lists of preferred items. This type of data is, is typically harder to collect because you're actually asking the user to um, provide feedback. It's also easier to game or the data is maybe a little less reliable because it's susceptible to users thinking they want to tell you what you want to hear um, or maybe they're not completely honest about what their preferences are. But it does allow you, uh, gives you the opportunity to collect both positive and negative feedback on items. Implicit feedback is uh, collected as the user is actively using your, your application. So uh, viewing an item, reading a blog post, uh, watching a video, listening to a song. Uh, in e-commerce, would be adding an item to a cart or even purchasing a product. This type of data is, is easier to collect uh, because you're not asking the user to explicitly provide feedback. You just want them to naturally use your application as they normally would. This makes this type of data um, harder to gain because Users may not even be aware that, that the activity they're, they're doing on your, with your application is used for recommendations. And it's also typically um, positive-only feedback, uh, which means simply that users are, are only going to read content or watch videos or listen to songs that they're interested in. So we'll look at um, uh, building recommender systems three different ways on AWS, look at three different architectures. There's more ways than this, but um, we're just going to highlight these three to give you a, give you a, a sense of um, different approaches. So the first is using Amazon Neptune, uh, building a collaborative filtering uh, query approach on Neptune. Uh, Neptune is AWS's fully managed graph database. Then we'll look at two machine learning approaches, one based on Amazon EMR using Apache Spark uh, that uses um, a technique called matrix factorization. And then we'll look quickly at a SageMaker um, option that uses uh, a deep matrix factorization approach. So looking at our graph-based solution first, um, graph-based will load our re uh, relationship between um, uh, individuals and products in a property graph. And property graphs are composed of vertices or nodes and edges that indicate relationships between two nodes. So in this case, we have uh, customers that have indicated that they've purchased products, uh, or two customers or users who know each other, or an interest in um, sports in this case. So with this data relationship data loaded in a graph, we're able to compose queries that um, implement a collaborative filtering um, solution uh, that allows us to make recommendations for products that users may want to purchase or users they might, may want to follow. So let's take a quick look at what one of these queries might look like um, using Gremlin query syntax. And I won't, um, I'll just uh, load the, the query up here and um, won't go through it step by step um, in the interest of time. But essentially what we're doing is we're finding the customer for which we want to make a recommendation. We're looking at all the products that they've purchased. And then we look at all the other customers that have purchased the same products as customer C1 in this case. Uh, then we go through a process of um, finding the number of uh, maximum number of products that have been purchased in common. We group those, cu those other customers that have made those purchases and look at the, those products that they bought. Um, executing this query then produces a list of products that we can use to recommend to customer C1. So what would an architecture look like that would em employ collaborative filtering with um, Amazon Neptune? So let's imagine we have an application that's composed of maybe a mobile app, um, tablet app, uh, and a desktop application. It's making dynamic application requests to a Lambda, Lambda series of Lambda functions in this case. This could just as easily be a Docker container-based application uh, or, or launched in um, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, Clickstream data is sent to Amazon Kinesis. There's a Lambda function that is consuming the Clickstream data out of Kinesis and responsible for updating the implicit data in our Neptune database. 
let's assume that the explicit activity or feedback is uh, we're storing that in an in a Amazon Aurora in a relational database. In order to synchronize updates that are made in Aurora to our Neptune database, we will use a change data capture um, pat development pattern, which uh, essentially has a, a database trigger and stored procedure that calls that Lambda function whenever data is changed in Aurora. That Lambda function then updates our Neptune database. So Neptune now has the implicit and explicit feedback that we need to build those queries to uh, provide recommendations back to our users. The link on this slide points to a, an example that go through step, step by step building a solution um, um, described here. Uh, and it will be in the slide that's gonna be published on SlideShare um, a couple of days from, here, from now. So we'll turn now to matrix factorization, which is a more of a machine learning approach um, to building uh, collaborative filtering. The approach taken here is essentially building a user item matrix of um, item, item ratings um, made by users. And so uh, we have a matrix here of users and items, users as rows, items as columns. And uh, for every rating that a user has given, we have a, um, an entry into, into the matrix. So the size of these, as you have, you know, get up to millions of users and, and thousands or hundreds of thousands of products, this matrix gets quite, quite large. And because users uh, typically will only rate a few items um, over time, uh, this, uh, the matrix is sparsely populated. This makes it difficult for, a, for us to work with and to perform calculations against. So matrix factorization is uh, an approach of using algorithms to decompose this sparsely populated uh, user item matrix into two smaller matrices, uh, U and V of T in this case, um, and these are called latent, um, latent factors, where the, we can make a prediction by summing the product between any item and user uh, to create a pr prediction that a missing rating in the matrix M. The challenge here is that these latent factors, it's, it's difficult to calculate their effect um, when, we're, when we're calculating uh, predictions. And so machine learning is used to optimize the effect of these latent factors uh, and minimizing against uh, a cost function. And so the two po popular approaches to uh, optimizing these latent um, factor effects are stochastic gradient descent and alternating least squares. And it just so happens that Apache Spark's MLlib has an implementation of collaborative filtering that uses the alternating least squares approach. Um, it supports both the implicit and explicit feedback that we, that we looked at. And it has some optimizations around um, optimizing for larger data sets, as well as a strategy for dealing with the cold start problem that, that uh, I mentioned earlier. So an application architecture that would use uh, Apache Spark on EMR looks something like this. So we'll have the same users using the application, sending clickstream data to Kinesis, and a dynamic request to uh, Lambda. This time we will have two consumers off of the Kinesis clickstream data. Uh, there's an Amazon data uh, firehose that's going to write the raw clickstream data to an S3 bucket. The other consumer we have is Amazon data analytics, uh, Kinesis Data Analytics, which is going to, going to allow us to uh, detect, detect trending uh, activity on our, on our applications. We'll write that trending data to Amazon Dyne, DynamoDB in this case. And even though this isn't part of the machine learning aspect, it's a way that we can incorporate um, any sort of trending activity and present that to our users to maybe give them content to engage with. Where the machine learning aspect comes in is that we'll perform um, typically, an ETL process is going to be needed to take the raw, the raw clickstream data and tra transform it into a format that uh, is more suitable for bringing into the machine learning uh, process. So there, we're going to use Amazon EMR to perform an ETL step, which writes it back to uh, S3. Then we will use a Spark MLlib uh, collaborative filtering pipeline to take in our implicit uh, feedback that from our ETL step as well as bring in our explicit feedback from that same Aurora database we had in the previous architecture. This will then write the predictions back into Amazon, Amazon DynamoDB, which is available to our application to uh, produce predictions and send recommendations back to, back to our users. So finally, let's look at uh, Amazon StageMaker. This is Amazon's uh, uh, fully managed service for 
uh, building, training, and deploying machine learning models. SageMaker uses an iterative process uh, where you start with building uh, based on pre-built uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks that um, have access to highly optimized machine learning um, algorithms. The training step uh, allows for one-click training of models, both machine learning and deep learning, as well as the option to bring your own uh, algorithms into SageMaker. You have access to uh, many of the uh, most popular frameworks out there today, including PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, MXNet, uh, Gluon, and many others. And then when you're ready to deploy your machine learning model, uh, SageMaker allows you to uh, deploy that model um, fully, um, fully managed deployment and provides an endpoint for you to integrate into your application. SageMaker provides several examples that are specific to what we're talking about today in personalization. There's a recommender system. Uh, there's also a, uh, another example that uses targeted direct marketing, uh, customer churn prediction, as well as forecasting uh, product demand. The link at the bottom of this slide will take you to the notebooks for each of these examples, so you can run those on your own. So um, the, the architecture for um, incorporating SageMaker, uh, we'll start with um, having our pre-trained, so we've already done our ETL process and we've dropped it into that um, S3 bucket. Uh, SageMaker will pull that in uh, using its um, training code and train the model. The artifacts will be written back out to S3. And then when the model is deployed uh, using inference code, it's pulled back out of that S3 bucket. And an endpoint is created that allows you to uh, make prediction calls or inference calls to that endpoint. So with that, I'll turn it over to Calvin and give us an overview of Segment's customer data infrastructure. Cool. Thanks, James. Uh, as said before, I'm Calvin. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CTO here at Segment. Uh, and in particular for this talk, I'm hoping to speed through a little bit of a brief overview of Segment, uh, just to give you an idea of what it does and how the tool works. But really, I think the main value will come from Onikit presenting on a bunch of the use cases about how Bonobos is using Segment plus AWS together. Because uh, as much as I can extol the virtues of Segment and how AWS works, uh, I think it's really most interesting to hear from customers out in the field and practitioners about how they're using the tools. So to give you a quick info, Segment provides customer data infrastructure. And what that means, if we unpack that a little bit, is that if you're running a business online, you have a lot of data about your users. Data that's coming through your website in terms of clickstream traffic or what pages users are viewing data about things like ad impressions for when users are seeing your brand, data maybe about purchases from point of sale systems or uh, maybe SAP databases that you have somewhere in your inventory. Essentially, if you're running a business at any sort of scale, there's probably lots of places where this data lives. And so Segment helps you collect it, get it into one single place where it's clean and organized, and then adapt it to hundreds of downstream tools. What this looks like is something over here on my right. You can see that Segment helps you collect data from various sources, which are on the left, and then it takes that data and funnels it to various destinations, places where you actually want to use that data. If we dive down a little bit more into the infrastructure, if you're curious about how it works, currently we're processing 300 billion events every single month. That translates to roughly 400,000 concurrent HTTP requests, and the entire infrastructure is containerized. It's all running in ECS. We're running across 250 different microservices, and we send data to hundreds of third-party APIs, different tools that our customers are using to analyze, message their data, or act upon it. And in particular, I wanted to highlight those hundreds of endpoints that we support. Now, in many cases, we support analytics use cases with things like data warehouses, like Redshift or BigQuery. We support messaging tools, uh, tools like SendGrid, Marketo, et cetera. Uh, we support analytics tools like Google Analytics or Mixpanel. But in particular, we have a class of tools that I would really say are close to infrastructure where you can take the data that Segment has collected and pipe it to your own infrastructure, whether that's Amazon, uh, S3, Kinesis, Redshift, Lambda, you name it. And in essence, this is what a lot of Segment customers do. They collect data from their apps, their mobile apps, maybe their internal ETL pipelines that they have running somewhere in their infrastructure. 
Maybe it's their Salesforce data, which they're trying to join together against their actual usage data. And they use Segment as the core collection point and pipeline, uh, kind of similar to what Jane's talked about earlier, as sort of the bridge between a bunch of those steps in that pipeline. And then separately, they can get that data out depending on who the end user is. So if they're an analytics person, they can analyze that data in Redshift. If maybe they're a data engineer, they can take that data from Kinesis and start piping it into their own recommendation systems. Uh, or maybe if they're someone who's just trying to experiment, uh, they can hook it up to a Lambda function. And really, this is a trend that we see happening over and over again with our customers, uh, and one that I'm hopeful Anakit will be able to shed more light on shortly. And so if you have particular questions, uh, definitely feel free to come find me after this talk or email us aws at segment.com. Uh, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to the real star of the show, Anika Bonobos. You're too kind. Thanks, Calvin. So I'm Anika. I oversee the analytics, data science, and data engineering team at Bonobos. Bonobos is the largest apparel company built on web. Our core value proposition is personalized fit. And we have 550,000 unique SKUs across a diverse assortment. So we offer jackets, uh, black tie, uh, suiting, but also casual t-shirts, casual shirts. And of course, we were most famous, as some of you might know, for our, our chinos. And so across that assortment, for our jackets, there's additional complexity because as an example with our jackets, uh, we have seven different fits. And for each fit, there's about 12 different sizes. So we have an athletic fit, we have a tailored fit, we have a slim fit, we have a standard fit, and then there's three other fits in big and tall. And so all that with our scale entails a good amount of complexity. And my team's mission is to use data, technology, and good judgment to solve the problems, business, and customer that arise from that complexity. And we do that by working and borrowing from two disciplines. So bringing the engineering rigor of building resilient systems that are robust and stay up and are low latency, along with uh, the analytics domain uh, goal of understanding why things are happening and how things could be optimized. And then based off what business needs are, tailoring ourselves to solve the, the problem at hand. The way that we do that is with infrastructure. And what we're solving for is what a lot of other B2C companies are solving for, which is the integration of the customer journey. There used to be a time where the classical example was that marketing had their data, and then uh, merchants or product people had their data. But really, the way that people interact with your business is as a journey that involves uh, the marketing touch points that brought them to the site, and then interactions across the product domain, uh, and being able to understand what's happening across both. So the way that we do that is with Segment, as Calvin was talking about earlier, Segment has uh, integrations with a lot of data partners, and our ability to get those into an event level stream, like a literal event level stream integrated uh, so that you can understand the evolution of touch points from a non-branded paid search ad where you were searching for chinos, and then you clicked onto Bonobos, and then you browsed on our site, and then purchased uh, a pair of chinos. Being able to understand that provides tremendous value to different people in our organization, but also to uh, our customers as we use that with machine learning to offer tailored recommendation and personalization services. So just to walk through our stack real quick, real fast, I'm going to point this laser here. Uh, so raw data comes in through segment via Kinesis. And then we, via EMR, do some processing and enriching. So there's, it's a lot of data cleanup, as well as extracting out the marketing events and, and sequencing those, and creating concepts of things like sessions. Uh, how long was someone browsing before 30 minutes of inactivity? And that happens across domains because there could be data coming in from our retail stores called guide shops or through web. And being able to understand and follow a customer across both domains is what happens between this to this step. And then from there, we stream that into services like propensity and personalization, which we'll get into. Or we put it into our analytics tools, which drive uh, decision making throughout the organization. One more thing to, to talk about is just data integrity. So uh, throughout the pipeline, we have alerting and monitoring for not only the is data there, is it meeting SLA, uh, but also are our KPIs right? An example of that is uh, 
product engineering uh, changed our revenue metric, but because we had monitoring, looking at our revenue metric and triangulating versus our production database, we were able to catch that issue really, quick, really quickly, which is important because our marketing team uses revenue as reported by segment in order to make you know, buy or spend decisions. And without the monitoring and the integrity checking, we wouldn't have caught that for probably quite some time. So let's get into what the different services are just as examples. So propensity is uh, trying to solve the problem of our conversion rate is, let's say, 3 to 4%. But we know that for every person that buys something, there's going to be a lot more people on our site that don't but are really high intent. Their buying temperature is quite high, but they just don't transact for whatever reason. And through a lot of data analysis, we found out that a lot of those reasons are confusion, uh, paradox of choice. We, you, know, you might be looking at our you know, fancy fabric that's more sure wicking suiting, or you might look at our traditional suits and not be able to make a decision. And sometimes that'll just cause you to, to leave the site because you don't know what to do. And that can also happen if you're competitive shopping versus us and our competitors. So in order to, uh, to identify these folks and then create an intervention, we built something called Propensity, which uh, takes data from Kinesis and also, this is an older arc diagram, but the idea is that it's taking product feature or, or data, features in the data that we engineered, such as session length, the marketing channel that you came from, and other attributes which describe who you are as a customer, and then building a prediction to understand what's the likelihood that you're going to convert in three minutes or five minutes. And from there, we make the prediction, and then our friends in product engineering will build experiences around that. So on the right, you can kind of see the way that we're thinking about it as we think that there's a good chance you'll convert, but you just might be a little bit price sensitive, then we can offer you a 20% off coupon. But in other situations, we might offer you a bundle to take what you're looking at, if it's a pant or shorts, for example, and bundle it with a shirt and offer a discounted deal for both. The idea is just to identify and build the right interventions for the right person at the right point in their journey. And that requires low latency architecture combined with being able to uh, do analysis and build machine learning models very rapidly and iteratively uh, within that infrastructure. Another use case is uh, personalization. So it's a similar sort of uh, infrastructure where we have data, segment data coming in through Kinesis, where we then have a Python application uh, that's pulling from something called Chelsea. And Chelsea for us is just a, a code name for uh, something that we're working on, which is a customer attribute matrix. So all the different attributes that describe you as a customer, such as lifetime value, your location, your shipping address, uh, along with some third party data, and then your, the, the, the products that, we, that you've been purchasing. What we want to do is sort of like building on work that Stitch Fix has done, create an abstract definition of style through data. Because if you think about someone, let's say, who might be a salesperson in no Omaha, Nebraska, they probably don't want our flamingo colored shirts. Maybe they do, but perhaps very likely looking at the data, they don't. What we want to do is offer you an outfit that most corresponds to what we think your style is, and then learn along the way as that definition evolves. And that's what this endpoint exposes. So uh, please find me after this, and I'll happily talk about the model. But for the in sake of the architecture diagram, what we want to say is we generate a matrix output that says customer to outfit that they probably want to buy. And we expose that in this Python application, which in combination with the streaming data uh, offers a real-time view of how to complement an outfit that someone's looking at. The best way to understand this is just to look at an example. So you're a user who's added some stuff to their cart, and we know that based off your style, or we think that based off your style, that you would probably want to buy these other things to complete the outfit that you would want to buy. And that's what manifests on our site. Cool. That's, a, that's the ARC stuff. And we can revert back to this. And I think we're going to transition now to a Q&A with Calvin. Cool. Let's do it. Ooh. Yeah, you want to bring this just over here? Yeah. Cool. All good? Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so I know before you were talking about how uh, you were basically monitoring data uh, in terms of like uh, fidelity, where, oh, we saw this one revenue metric drop, or we changed it around somehow, and now we're alerting on it. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe just take a step back and walk me through 
what are the top three to five most important KPIs to Bonobos as a business? Like, what are the things that you're looking at every day? Sure. So, for us as an e commerce retail business, our AOV, our conversion rate, so that's decomposes to order volume and, and traffic, uh, both in guide shops and web. So, we actually have, like, as a lot of retailers do, cameras, which just uh, record how much traffic is coming to our stores and being able to define metrics based off that to then develop and identify anomalies is, is important. So conversion rate, uh, then the average retail price of what we're uh, presenting, especially because if we're offering you a 20% off thing as a part of the propensity model, we want to identify how much of that is coming from uh, the retail price to ensure that we're not cutting too much into our margins. Mm, gotcha. And in terms of like how that's calculated, do you get kind of a daily report or like who's looking at those things? Is it something that's sent to the company or? Yeah, so we have a daily report that goes out every morning that articulates the past day and how we're trending versus the week, as well as our forecast for the year. Gotcha, cool. Um, and in terms of the pipeline, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how your work fits in with the org as a whole. Um, like I understand your team is running the data pipeline, but who are the consumers of it? So data consumers. Let's, let's take a, a few different examples, because I think that, that, that might be helpful. So we have uh, a ninja team. They're not actual ninjas, but they, we, we call them ninjas. They're our CX reps, and they're amazingly helpful uh, if you uh, ever transact with us. So th the way that they field customer calls is by looking at the dashboards which are embedded. We have Looker dashboards uh, embedded into uh, their, their laptops, so as they get different calls from customers about different issues, uh, the dashboard will filter the customer and they can then use that data to make like on the fly judgments. So if you've been a long standing customer, then we can uh, definitely you know, do something extra. We, we try to go the mile, the extra mile for every customer, but go the extra, extra mile uh, if you've been a longer customer. Mm -hmm. Another example is marketing. Um, Cyber Monday was the biggest day of the year for us. We get 10X our normal traffic, and they, they're making intra-hour decisions to buy or sell. They have their, their agency on the call, on the phone with them, and based off the, the data pipeline, giving them real-time views of how much each keyword they're bidding on is driving traffic to each product category. They're making like calls like, you know, I want to buy, buy, buy on Flamingo shirts because <laughs> they want to keep feeding that pipeline of advertising that they're purchasing. Yeah, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about that in terms of Cyber Monday. Like, what was the request volume looking like? Like, what sort of latency were you trying to guarantee, just so I have a sense? Sure, so normally we're looking at like two to three million per day, but okay. 10X that on Cyber Monday in every dimension, uh, so. And two to three, three million, that's like sales, or? Oh, no, uh, I wish, but <laughs> the two to three million uh, uh, requests. Okay. Of, uh, basically, you could look at it as, uh, discrete inquiries of, of customer interactions to our pipeline. Gotcha. And in terms of the latency on that, are you trying to get decisions like hourly, daily, sure. sub-second? So the way that we started, uh, let's say a year ago, was the, the classic batch, you know, I'm gonna process this data overnight and people are gonna consume it in the morning. And now we are very much moving towards a stream all the things architecture. Uh, as you saw from the from the diagram, and that actually has driven a lot of intra hour decisions, especially on traffic heavy days because m our marketing team as well as other teams have actual levers they can pull uh, based off of the more updated data and also an understanding of who the customer is yeah, can you give me an example? Is it only ad spend where it 's the kind of thing where it matter like hours matter or are there other like examples where so Ad spend is definitely one thing, and it's a big growth lever for us, so it comes to mind. But in our retail stores as well, uh, being able to have an understanding, we have uh, about 60 retail stores, and it's very tactical for the retail store, but being able to understand uh, and what's driving people to our site as well as mm. what's going on can help. Very small decisions which don't seem to be that important, but actually are when you think about the retail experience. For example, do we, if we're running out of inventory for a certain type of clothing, do we take it out of the window and put something else there? That, that type of stuff seems small, but it cumulatively adds up over time for the decisions that the retail store, store managers make. Yeah, um, I know, so your retail stores are a little bit different than a normal retail store, right? That's a good, that's yeah. a good call out, something worth mentioning. So our retail stores are interesting because you walk in there and you get fitted because we wanna use it as a vehicle to create the concept of fit and you don't walk out with anything because we don't have an inventory there. So we, we use it almost as a showroom to, to, to say that here you get fitted, you can check out all, all of our different clothing, and we, we use that data 
and it's very important data to, uh, from a point of sale standpoint to say that this person tried on this or that and what patterns were they interested in and can we use that into, as feedback into future models. I see. Is the like salesperson or customer service rep like writing all those things down and recording them somewhere, or is it? It's being captured than that? from a, from like the iPad point of sale okay. uh, application that we're using. Nice, cool. And Which is I, also firing the like the meta segment events too. Oh, gotcha. To, to capture that and, and feed it into the pipeline, because what, what becomes really powerful is when you take those events and you know, marry them with our clickstream and then get a real omni-channel look at the, at the business instead of the classic, you know, this is what happened in retail stores. The way that things actually happen is more like, you know, especially if you're going to make a $1,000 purchase as a suit or $1,000 or less, you're going to go to the store and then you're going to go online. And being able to identify those people is really helpful for different people in the business. Makes sense. So I'm kind of an amateur analyst, I would say. Uh, I'm curious if you, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure less amateur than me. Um, I'm curious if you could walk me through maybe a day in the life of either an analyst or a data scientist. Like, what are they looking at, and then how do they actually arrive at either insights or like stuff that makes it then back into the product or changes the business in some way? Sure. So let, let's let's give a couple examples. So yeah. uh, for me, just philosophically, I think that the role of analyst is is shifting a bit. Where traditionally you might be like a marketing analyst and you do marketing stuff, but so it's talking about that the customer journey is becoming something that you can now interlink and really what you put marketing dollars in is going to influence your product. So you really want to look at it holistically. Mm. And analysts' work product is insight, right? So as the complexity and granularity of data increases. Analysts' work kind of becomes dispersed as roles across a team. Um, and so let's, let's get into a couple examples as to what I'm talking about there. Uh, you saw some of the stuff that we built out with personalization. And in order to even build propensity, which is predicting that someone's going to convert, that requires a ton of analysis of looking at people's paths across our site to identify when are people actually confused and developing lots of hypotheses. So analysts and data scientists are working together because analysts are the folks who are actually building out the things that become features in our data. For example, identifying that this marketing channel generates more or high, higher or lower quality traffic, and that should therefore be separated out into certain features of the machine learning model that the data scientist is going to put into production. Another example is analysts are working to sort of be like a Switzerland type role where marketing mm. might be putting certain ads that are, and this is actually happening as mobile is becoming more important. A lot of marketing's ad spend is driving mobile traffic. A product just built a feature called unified carts where if you add something to your mobile web experience, it'll propagate across the desktop. Oh, and, that's cool. and the, well, the question is, what's driving mobile traffic? Is it unified card experience, or is it, uh, is it marketing dollars going to, to mobile? So analysts have to kind of find the signal through all that noise and, and develop a recommendation that the business can move forward on. Yeah. Did you find out the answer, which it was? It's, you know, it, yes, but you're not going to like it. It's just <laughs> the, the answer is, as it usually is, is something along the lines of there are certain things that are working, and there are certain things that are working from, from both ends. There's no, there's no smoking gun. You know? So you gotcha. can't really, everyone wants to know how much value something drove, but it, it's often very difficult to say that it was this much without testing, and no one has the patience for test to read significance, generally speaking. So, <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so it's hard. Yeah. So one other question I have that I want to ask you about, um, I feel like a number of our customers fall in sort of the spiritual divide where some of them say, like, oh, uh, just collect all the data. We'll eventually clean it up and figure it out. And so just put it in a data lake on S3, and we'll get to it later. And then other customers are all about having really clean data, where they've like, meticulously figured out the schema and understand, uh, here's what this data point means. Here's when it's collected in the application flow. I have a strong sense of every property that should be associated with it. Um, I was curious for your take. Do you like, fall more in the data lake camp or the ETL camp? Uh, do you have strong opinions there? So uh, I definitely agree with put, always put it in S3 is, is a great <laughs> rule. Uh, I'll also say that like a, a lot of the tooling that Segment provides and what AWS provides makes it very easy to end up in a situation, which is not a bad situation, that all your data is in Redshift, let's say. Um, and the thing is to be careful there is just trying to figure out the problem you want to solve. So let's say that you, you want to understand your clickstream. Mm -hmm. You could do all that processing in on Redshift, but 
it's not, let's say, the most elegant solution versus abstracting that out into something like Kinesis and then using uh, EMR with Spark to process the clickstream and then dumping the results of that or loading the results of that into Redshift. So I think that it just depends on where you are with the maturity curve. But the way I see things evolving is that we're going to reach a place where people want to be as low latency as possible and they want to be uh, at a place where they're using the right tool for the job. And that's probably going to result in infrastructure that's more data lake-like versus your traditional batch process overnight into Redshift and use that. I see. So then for that data lake, I'm curious, like, how do you manage schema, for instance? Like, how do you make sure that bad data doesn't end up in there somehow and just throws off your entire analysis? That's a good question. So bad data is, uh, there's a good O'Reilly book called uh, Good Data, Bad Data, and How to Clean It All Up, yeah. which, is, <laughs> which is helpful to help me think about this. So bad data often comes up. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, there's, th there's going to be unknown unknowns about bad data, so you have to work with what you have, and that often comes from the business finding out after the fact. And so you, I, try, I try to look at it as it should be as easy as possible to clean up the data and restate things as you figure things out that mm -hmm. are wrong. And that's facilitated by having the right tools. So for example, processing the clickstream with Spark makes it much easier for us to iterate and clean up data as we identify it as being wrong versus having it all in Redshift and having to reload all, all the things because you figured out that your A-B testing tool optimizely was generating garbage sessions and that your conversion rate you know, might be actually higher than you thought it was just because the, the traffic counts were off from uh, bad data being generated, which was actually something that happened. So what's, what's important there is just to have the right architecture to uh, move forward with the new insight and, and also document that in a place where everyone understands why the data was bad. I see. And so let's say, um, I don't know, for example, your Android app has an event, which is uh, order completed when it should be completed order. Like, do you store that mapping somewhere? Is that in code or is that like in queries that everyone is using together? Or like, do you repaint the data? Right. Yeah, I understand your question. Exactly. We, it's in code. So there's a, a, a processing layer. Uh, let me see if I can go back a bit here. So. Within this, oops. Within this infrastructure right here, this journey processing uh, layer is what actually cleanses the data, and we implement rules that filter out certain data. And it's as simple or naive as just like a where clause in the like Spark SQL to say that mm. filter this out because the Android thing was as you said it was, and that's bad. And then. Yeah. You know, things are commented, and that way people's downstream queries aren't affected by the bad data. I see. I assume those queries get really big, though, huh? If, like, you're having a bunch of these changes that you're making just sort of historically over time, maybe you're trying to run analysis over years or something? Oh, uh, you mean the, the, the cleansing queries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they do. Like, that's a, that's a good call out. And I'd, yeah. I'd love to learn even, like, a better way to handle it, but it's just, it's interesting because data is this weird layer between the people building the website yeah. and the people trying to understand what happened on the website and cleaning it up and maintaining something that's robust while at the same time fulfilling the other wishes around low latency uh, just requires this ability to propagate business logic and clean up logic uh, through your code base. Yeah, I know what a bunch of our customers do is they have like a Google spreadsheet somewhere where they like keep track of which events they're sending and like what those should mean. Um, we saw this pattern enough times that we just eventually built a product to solve this problem, uh, which is our new protocols product. But I don't know if yeah. you handle something similar. Yeah, so we, we also have our Google sheet, uh, spreadsheet. So and I was quite interested in the protocols product yeah. because the, the problem here is that we, let's say to bring back the, the revenue tracking issue that I mentioned or hinted at earlier, what happened there was just uh, we accidentally made a code change that caused revenue to be calculated as gross instead of net of discounts. Mm. So it looked like we were, let's say, making more money than we were. Um, the part of the issue there was just that we manage everything via Google spreadsheet of each, each event that we're generating and what the canonical metadata should be. So it, it can be challenging to, unless you have like the learning and monitoring that we built out to know that something went wrong. Yeah, yeah. And that's where something like protocols is interesting because it's at the, it's at the layer of implementation that you can start tracking that. Yep, exactly. We're, at, we're actually building a spreadsheet importer so that people can easily migrate. Uh, it's because we see it happening so much. Um, cool. I wanted to know a little bit more about um, what you're doing with ML, particularly for personalization. Um, 
I know you showed kind of the like fit use case where you say, hey, based upon what's in your cart, uh, let's suggest new items that would fit with this outfit. Um, I'm curious, are there other things that you're doing to personalize the way bonobos.com looks and feels or your mobile apps? Sure, so I'm gonna just fast forward to this diagram here where we have this thing called Chelsea. And mm -hmm. I think that answering your question, this requires talking about the way that we w operate in terms of building out and, and partnering with uh, product engineering who are building out experiences. So our mission is to create the most robust and accurate model possible. So let's say we build out personalization. Mm -hmm. We have a big matrix of user attributes and we have a big matrix of products and we wanna align those two and create a machine learning model that is most accurate of aligning the two. And then from there, expose it in an endpoint that product engineering can query from. And then let's say build something on the website or build something in guide shops it could be, for example, the iPads that guides use. Can we show what outfits that they should help people try on based off who someone is? We just want to create an updated and robust output that they can use to build out experiences across whatever platform it, that, it, that they feel is best for the user experience. So, and that can manifest in a variety of ways. Yeah, cool. In terms of monitoring sort of the overall pipeline, um, I know a bunch of customers of ours, uh, they have sort of this like snaking uh, internal data pipeline that they built out. Uh, and maybe one part off to the side will break, but it'll break some critical business workflow and kind of no one will notice because the data engine team is working on a bunch of different pieces. Like, does that sound familiar at all? Or how do you monitor all the pieces of the system, make sure data's not delayed and it doesn't flatline or? Oh yeah, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, I think it's just about how you, you mitigate it because this is a system like in any, in any system you need to have, uh, things will break and you need to know one, that something broke and then two, mm -hmm. have a, a call tree or some means of, of establishing expectations with people who depend on it, on the data to do their jobs. And so the way that we've handled that is we have a call tree for data and we have different SLAs. So we have a, hey, this is something that's affecting our ability to understand how much money we're making. And so it needs to be fixed right away. And then other things, we have 24, 72 hour SLAs to identify and fix the thing that broke. Yeah, can you give an example of what are the things like in each of those categories? I, I get the, the first one is how much money you're making, but like what about like 24 hour or 72 hour? Sure, so 24 hours would be something that, again, I go back to marketing a lot because for most B2C companies, they are, the, the, the folks driving the growth engine. So mm -hmm. a lot of the business is centered around ensuring that they can make those decisions that drive growth as effectively as possible. And so if something that something breaks, let's say between uh, a major spend channel for us, which would be, let's say Google paid search ads, because that's where a lot of, we find a lot of folks looking for clothing is, hey, someone search for, for chinos or for where can I buy a suit? And we, we pop up, so being able to fix that within 24 hours, because it's not something that needs to be fixed overnight, but it's something that if we don't fix it, I can look at our CPA for the previous day and tell you exactly how much opportunity cost there is. I see. And so fixing that within the next day is generally ideal. And then for 72 hours, it'd be more like, let's say something that isn't mission critical, but still important. A lot of that would be around inventory data, things affecting CX. So it would affect individual customers or their ability to help individual customers, but not scale to the business. So we want to fix it generally within the week, but not immediately. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple last questions here before we turn it over to audience questions. Um, in terms of uh, your machine learning pipelines, is there a single like feature or set of features where you can look at a user and say, like, based upon this attribute, they will be a good Bonobos user? Like, what's that's, most important? So that's, that's a great question. And that, that's, that's like the million dollar question, probably <laughs> literally. But uh, we, we've looked at our, we've done a segmentation of our customer base and we find that most of our revenue comes from about a third of our users, right? So how do you identify that one in three mm -hmm. type of customer? And what's been helpful there has been a lot of understanding what people are, who people are using third-party data to, to understand that, you know, different occupations. And then based off of that, uh, modeling user behavior against that data to then identify that this person, based off of the behaviors and product categories they're looking at, things like that, like small faint signals, can we cumulatively identify that someone is, is going to be uh, one of those one in three? 
we actually have a predictive CLV model that, that helps with this. And uh, it's, it's used for actually, again, back to marketing, because if you can identify those, you want to look at the marketing channels they came from and sensibly invest more there, because there's hopefully more people that are like that. And uh, the, I think your question hinted at machine learning, right? So yeah, and, yeah. And the features that drive that. And so a, a lot of unsupervised learning to get at the latent variables, which we can then engineer into features, and, and then build into this predictive CLE model. But it's an ongoing process. Gotcha. I'm here, are there like, uh, I don't know, particular features which you would have said like, oh, there's no way this is correlated, and then like suddenly this model spat out like, oh, it turns out that, uh, I don't know, people from Arkansas, like between 25 and 30 who are employed at Walmart, you know, or like wherever it is, like they are really good Bonobos users. Like what was the most surprising sure. thing? Hmm, interesting. Most surprising would be Probably just looking, I guess surprising, but isn't the right word, it interesting is, so I'm gonna sub that out. Okay. It's, it's just understanding that machine, like successful machine learning requires combining all these features. So let's say you're in Miami, that's where it's not surprising when you, when you when I say it out loud now, but the, that's where we sell most of our swimwear as well as like flamingo shirts. And then in Nebraska, we sell a lot of just black suits. I don't know why that is, but it's true. You know? And identifying that there are certain, let's call them personas, which, which correlate with these features, and there are certain, let's say, geographic, or maybe the geography is, a, is not granular enough, but it's a, it's a lagging indication of something about the people who live there that we can understand preferences or affinities for certain product categories, and then being able to translate that into CLV uh, and you, what you realize is that you, you have to be very nuanced about how you drill into things because in aggregate, things aren't generally as, as helpful or meaningful. But when you start looking and cutting the data in, across the right ways, that's when machine learning becomes really mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, I'm here, how many of those personas would you say you have now? We have somewhere between 12 and 20, depending on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, because I feel like, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, Basically, someone's running analytics and like coming up with maybe two or three personas that match their different buyers. Uh, but kind of as you take this trend of just running machine learning models against the data you already have, it's like almost you could get kind of a perfect persona for each individual user based upon all of these different traits, kind of. So just a, a couple of thoughts on that. What's yeah. interesting and what can make things difficult is just that the the way that people might dress for work is more conservative versus at home. Mm -hmm. So we have to create this identifier because we see people in Nebraska buying flamingo shirts, but then we also see them buying black suits. And it's because they're, I imagine, wearing one thing to work and one thing on the weekend. And being able to create that as an entity, along I with see. fashion yeah, as an entity, tough. Is, is tough, but it's a fun challenge. Yeah. Um, another thought is just that we have identified certain personas based off of, you know, I think your original question was, what's the most predictive? And I think that that has to do with occupation. And then there's mm -hmm. an entire problem around identifying that because I know that jeans and t-shirts correlate very strongly around Silicon Valley as well as uh, what they're calling the Silicon Alley in New York City. I don't know if that's actually a thing though. Uh, but also I see a lot of bankers who just buy suits and then you see other personas, especially in the South, of a lot of like, seersucker, very classic American kind of clothing developing, and, and just identifying that and, and creating the personas and the recommendations tailored to the personas. Cool. All right, well, I think we'll end it there. Um, anyone in the audience have some quick questions before we wrap up here? if you can hear me, I was, I was asking about the pricing. Um, with the dynamic pricing, you said 20% offer, 10% offer based on the person. Is that a real-time function? And if so, how do you, I know when Amazon did that, they had a lot of resistance, right? Because one person would see a different price than the other. Like Expedia and those um, companies, like airlines, have gotten better acceptance with that. I work for Eddie Bauer, and you know we'd be real hesitant to, to send that dynamic pricing model out um, have you seen success with that and acceptance with that concept? Or sure, how, how do you do that? We've done it through uh, like email or other more mm. segmented, but when you put it on the web, it's a different experience. That's, that's a totally fair question. So we, I actually I agree with you. I, I think that dynamic pricing can very adversely affect the user experience. And so the way that we approach that is more along, along the idea of offering a targeted discount. So prices won't change on our site 
but via email and via our site itself, we, if we can predict that you're there and just need something like an extra intervention, we might offer, let's say, 20% off. You know? But if we look at that as, as, as a model. It's really no different than if you were to call in to our company and talk to one of our ninjas, they'll, they'll say, okay, well, like, you know, if it helps you get through the door, here's take, take 20% off. So it, we, we look at it as something that will help people get across the finish line of the transaction, but not so much as, hey, we're going to test this and it's going to be $30 for you and then $40 or, you know, if you want on incognito mode. Cool. One back there. Uh, just two quick questions. One is, how do you use you know, your platform to you know, launch a new product or delete an existing product? And I guess the second question is, you know, when, when it comes to pricing or discounts, I mean, you know, how much do you rely on inventory? You know, do, so do you, do you factor inventory into your sort of overall, you know, filtering process? Uh, what was the first question one more time? Uh, you know, how you add and delete products. Oh, so adding or deleting products is maintained via our, there's a, is it on here? It's not in the art diagram, but we have a, uh, a means of just being able to go into the, the product feeds that are feeding into the data and just remove things. And that's a good question because I think it ties into your second question, inventory, because if things sell out quickly, which can happen for, uh, and does happen quite often for certain products which become very popular that we didn't expect, uh, we need to be able to remove that from the product feed. And when things do go out of stock, we, we absolutely take that into consideration. And it drives a lot of the, let's say, cyber money buying decisions, which is uh, if people are buying lots of Flamingo shirts and we run out of supply for those, we need to have a, a real-time means of being able to inform that into the models which marketing are using to invest in other shirts that we do have greater quantities of. And the way that we do that is actually, again, not in the arc diagram, but we have a through our third-party logistics provider, we have a Kinesis stream feeding in uh, a queue of inventory data and how much we have available uh, to ship out to customers. How does your recommendation engine work on new customers that, let's say you don't know their style, they haven't added anything to their cart, or only have visited uh, minimal product pages? That's a great question. And actually, it hints uh, to something Calvin was talking about, about the idea of personas. I think I mentioned that there's 12 to 20 kind of base personas that we have. And so as a new customer, the amount of signals that we're collecting from you are you know, not that many. But what we can do is at least look at one of three, let's say, default, can, default outfits that you might want or be interested in, and then use that until more data becomes available. Cool. Uh, I think we've got to end it there for time, uh, but uh, we'll be off to the side afterwards if anyone wants to come up. So yeah. thank you, Annika. Thank you, James. And, uh, thank you. Please do uh, complete the session survey. Yes. <laughs>